And when that happens, guess what? Nobody will know anything about Daniel. When Daniel was captured, when he was 15, 16, when he came to the court of Babylon, he was sent to Babylonian University. For three and a half years, there he learned Chaldean language. He dressed like Chaldeans. Only one thing that distinguished him, his weird vegan diet. He is the odd one at the cafeteria. He asked too many questions. What is in that? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> he always has these uh, weird questions, right? He's the odd. That's the only thing, but besides that, uh, I mean, come on, I mean, the, the Babylonians and the Jews, they're a little about the same, yes or no? We're not talking about Chinese versus French, okay? So Daniel, uh, now he's learned to speak Chaldean, and I'm sure in a modest way he was wearing like Chaldeans, right? And he also has a Chaldean name, Dr. Nazar, right? So after two, you know, one or two or three years in the university, people cannot really distinguish where is God's people among so many Babylonians. And guess what? God did not like that. God says, I don't want my people to be distinguished. Not like many Southern Baptists, they don't want to be distinguished. God says, I don't want my people to be distinguished. I want to show them, show the Babylonians who are my people. So in order to accomplish that, God gave, and he has many things to accomplish, but that's one of the major ones. So God gave the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar, but when he woke up, he doesn't remember, so then he has to go find out from all, all from his wise men, but then he was, he's gonna find out his wise men are not so wise. So then they have to come to Daniel to kill him, but Daniel will say, because he is his faith is in God, he will say, Give me some time, I will show the king the dream and interpretation. Do you think that was a big news at that time? Do you think that was big news? Even though it happened at night time, do you think that was big news? You better believe it. Why? Even without Facebook and Twitter, the message went everywhere. Why? Because King is about to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. It's a big news yes or no? It is an I mean, overnight crisis. Yeah? And I'm gar I guarantee not only the wise men, but their family members too. So it's going to be a slaughter, but a day of sla slaughter because the king had a bad dream. Because he got up on the wrong side of the bed. Can you imagine what people were people talking talk, talk, talk. about? What, what, what? The king had a dream, but he doesn't forget. He doesn't remember. And he's demanding the wise men to tell him the dream. That's, that's ridiculous, unreasonable, not fair. But because of that, that because they cannot tell him the dream, they want to kill, he's going to kill all of them. What? No way. But then there's a little news. There's a guy named Who? What? What was his name? What was his name? That's what, what, what? He's what? Hebrew? What's his Hebrew name? Daniel? That little young man? What? He says he's going to show the king the dream and the interpretation? What? Now everybody is thinking about Daniel. Are you getting this? They are based upon event, based upon the event, based upon the circum circumstantial situation, they were forced to think about this man named Daniel and his friends. And when Daniel was standing before the king, king, your wise man cannot tell you. And then, you know what happened. Oh, king, let me tell you what you saw. Image, stone, destruction. Let me tell you the interpretation. The head of gold is you. Next kingdom, third kingdom, fourth kingdom, iron clay, and a stone, a lesson kingdom. When king heard that, there and then, he made this announcement. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a true it is that your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings. 
kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing Daniel. You, Daniel, among all the wise men of Babylon, you could reveal this secret. So through this experience, God was able to accomplish, number one, reveal the true God, number two, reveal the people of true God. Who belongs to God's people? So, in Daniel chapter 2, God sealed the dream in order to reveal God's people. Are you listening? Yes. Are you thinking with me? That is the reason why God sealed the dream. In order to do that. So we take that scenario and we bring it to 2,300 days. Remember, 2,300 days, that prophecy was open when? 1798. Okay. It was only open in 1798. Why? Why only 1798? Only a few years before 1844. Why only that time? Because, ladies and gentlemen, you already know, based upon 1,260 year time prophecy, from 538 until 1798, we had this 1260 years of dark age. I understand. A positive movement started maybe 300 years, maybe two or 300 years before that, but officially speaking, we call that the dark age based upon Bible policy. But this is what happened. You see, during this time, Roman Catholic Church was the dominating religion in the West. Okay? But then, Protestant movement began to happen in the 16th century. And you have all these different denominations and churches coming out. Lutheran, uh, Reformed, Calvinist, Presbyterian, Anglican, Church of England. You have Restorationism, Pentecostals, Episcopal, and then you have Baptists. And we have Methodists, Anabaptists, later on, Adventists. Uh, we're not talking about Seventh-day Adventists, but we're talking about Advent movement. You understand? All these different denominations came out. Are you following? So, listen. 1798 is the end of papal supremacy. So, after 1798, during this time, okay, there were so many Protestant churches, so many denominations. They all claim we are the Church of God. You with me? But at that time, including even Adventists, uh, when I say Adventists, Advent movement, early Advent movement, it, during that time, most of them, them, okay, most of them, they, even though they call themselves Protestants, Reformers, but they all have a very similar image. What image? Image of Roman Catholic Church. All of Boston have an image of Roman Catholic Church. How come? You see, my friends, when they came out, they did not completely cut off everything that was false teaching from Roman Catholic Church. When they came out, they all came out with a souvenir from Roman Catholic Church. A souvenir. And what souvenir was that? Is called Sunday worship. So they call themselves Protestants, but they all have a little image of Babylon. So in a sense, in a sense, they still, still, they all look, the beings of denominations, they all look Babylon. You with me? So what the God is saying is this. I will seal the prophecy of 2,300 days until 798. But after that, I will open that. And God is saying, whoever can, whoever can read the prophecy of 2,300 days and rightly interpret it, they are my people. They are my people. That's 
why the mighty angel comes down with a little book open, meaning whoever understands this, you are my people. Are you understanding this? So whoever can understand 2,000 million things, but the funny thing is many Adventists today, they cannot explain 2,000 million things. That's sad. That is really sad. So then, so then what happened? You know what happened. It was William Milner who studied Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Oh, he studied a lot from the Bible. Oh, he studied from Genesis. But then when he came to Daniel chapter 8, verse 18, he discovered this prophecy. And he started studying it even more. And he discovered in his own mind, okay, Jesus is coming back in 1843. Did he understand 2,000 days? Yes or no? No. no. He was, in a sense, part of the, the, the leading group, but not confirmed. I mean, of course, I'm not saying we don't know what I'm saying. That's a, different, that's a different story. We're talking about God's denominated church. So William Miller, he was proclaiming Jesus is coming back in 1843. And they even had a chart, a chart that goes along with their teaching. And they have a con conclusion. Jesus will come back 1843, right there, see? But then what happened? <laughs> according, to, um, according to the Rise of the Advent Movement, page 192, chapter 11, it says, in approximately 130 camp meetings held in 1843 and 1844, between five 500, 500,000 and 1 million were estimated to have attended. Can you imagine? 130 camp meetings. That means they have like two camp meetings going on at the same time, like every week. How many weeks do you have? 52. 130 camp. What is that? Sometimes three camp meetings in one week. Can you imagine? How eager, how how passionate the people were. Jesus is coming back. Yes, they were wrong about 1843. So then they changed the date again to 1844. And Jesus is coming back in 1844. And they were so excited. And people were expecting this great second coming event. And people were just at, uh, attending camp meetings. 130 camp meetings in one year. And many of us get tired of just one camp meeting. And for one camp, we don't even go for the whole time. We just go for the weekend. <laughs> and when we go, we're not just there for spiritual food. We're there to just socialize. But these people, they're attending camp meetings. They're giving up their, their crops in their farm. They're giving up their cows in the barn. And they're giving up their bars. And they're giving up their business. They're giving up their jobs. They're just, you know, just devoting their whole time to proclaim the message. Get ready. Jesus is coming back. I know, I know, they had a wrong day, they had a, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, had a, uh, they had a right day, but they had a wrong event. I understand that, but it was God himself that was leading them to believe that way. And, and you ask the question, why? I don't know, completely, but that was God's design. And just looking back, I know why he did that. Because uh, when he... When the message of the second coming is proclaiming Jesus coming back in 1844, everybody joined. Many with fear, some with divine true love. But even then, it's hard to distinguish the wheat and tear. It's really hard to distinguish the right and the righteous and those who are not so sincere. But look at this. So they, they estimate between Half a million to a million people attend the camp meeting. And what's the population of America back in those days? 17 million. Can you imagine? Do you think that was a big news? Yes or no? <clears throat> you think early Advent movement was a big thing? Back in those days, you better believe it. It was a major, major event. Everybody knew about it. And according to some uh, historians, out of that many people who attended, there were one. 100,000 people sincerely following Advent movement. 
100,000 people sincerely waiting for Jesus to come back in 1844, October 22nd. 100,000. Would you get excited if you're part of 100,000 movement? That's a lot of people, yes or no? But guess what happened? Those 100,000 people, all of them, guess what? They're still keeping Sunday. They're waiting for a second coming. And their understanding of 2,300 days, not complete. Not complete. They were considered part of the Advent movement, but not spent as God's people yet. Not like them. Why? Because they did not completely understand. So around 100,000 people waiting for Jesus to come back in 1844, October 22nd. And guess what happened? Nothing happened. The great disappointment. The great disappointment. Some historian says, some of these Advent people, they cry from midnight until the day was breaking in the morning. They cry all night. Can you imagine? For years, we're talking about 10, 15, 20 years they've been waiting for this, preparing for this. They keep up. Every, there's so many things in their life for this, and then it doesn't happen. And you know what happened? We're talking about more than 95% of the people they left the group. Only a handful of people left behind. Can you imagine? How would you feel? Before, 100,000 people. Wow, this is exciting. Oh, I'm a church member. That's exciting. Let's go over there. Yeah, man. Good, 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 good. Boom! Over one night, they all left. Walked away. And some historian says only around 50 people left behind. 50. Among them, 16 year old Ellen G. White, 18, 19 year old James White, Jan, and, and you have all the Joseph Bates. You have all the, only Joseph Bates and some one more person who's kind of older one, but many of them were <coughs> young. 16, 17, 19, 21, 22. Young people. Young people. They're crying all night. Did they give up? Before it was 100,000 people, but now, like 50 people, like a handful. But then, they persevered. And then God, through this, one of the pioneers, gave the understanding of, oh, it's not about second coming. It is about Jesus entering into the most holy place. And then, just a few months later, through the prophecy of Ellen White, God confirmed that that was the truth. So in December 1844, confirmation based upon the, the, the gift of spirit prophecy, and then understanding the Bible, right there, just, just a few hundred people, just a few hundred meager people understood the meaning of 2,300 days. And God said, they are my people. So why God allowed the disappointment? Because he needed to weed out those are in for just emotional purpose. Just for excitement. He wants people who can endure through disappointments, challenges. He wants people that can go back to the body and says, God, I will not rest until I get it straight from the Bible and I stand up on the Bible and buy it alone. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that many of our Adventist people today were losing that spirit. Many times we just want to be entertained spiritually, but not Bible-based, not biblical-based, not what God says based. 
And we get, we get like agitated, irritated, we get a little frustrated if we get a little more serious about the Bible or reading the spirit of prophecy or bringing on wise writings. We get a little com uncomfortable about that. We get uncomfortable if you get too deep into the doctrine. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to stand up. What do you say? Yeah. It's about time. Look at the angel saying, look, my angel says, this little book is open. 2,308 prophecy. Whoever can understand this, you are my people. But what was, the, what was required? What was the payment in order to understand that? Great disappointment that God led them to have. Same thing with the disciples. So that was their sweet and bitter experience. Can you continue even though you had this bitter experience? Meaning people do not appreciate you. Can you imagine now when you when you're a seven Baptist, you always have to walk around with this image. What image? Ah, you're wrong. Can you imagine? You have to walk around with the with the big sign on your forehead. I was completely wrong about Jesus coming in 1844. How embarrassing that is. Yes? But then guess what? God allowed those God's people to have that little little step on their forehead. Why? Because that kind of ridicule is necessary element in order for you to develop your faith in God and God alone. Why? Because you don't seek man's approval. You only seek the approval of God. That's how we don't compromise with uh, cultural issues or the uh, now these days things are different. No, 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 don't go by that. We don't seek man's approval, cultural approval, we see God's approval. You know how Jesus was born? You know what label that Jesus had on his forehead? You think people always look at him like, oh, Jesus, Messiah, Rabbi, oh, here comes the holy man, oh, this. No, no. People laugh at him. You know why? Because he cannot really tell them who his father is. He is born out of fornication. Mary had a little, you know, strange thing going on. Yeah, we know from the Bible what happened, but for many people, <laughs> Jesus was born out of fornication. That means his mother is a whore. Do you understand? Jesus walking around with that reputation, but he did not allow that to even flinch him for a second, because he knows. Is found upon the word of God. Do you understand? Do you understand? What about the disciples? What about the disciples? They're walking around with what? What label on their forehead? Your, your master, he died. Why he was resurrected? Ah, come on. You stole his body. <laughs> They're walking around with the idea your savior died. You want to follow him? Yeah, you die too. Listen, if you want to be part of God's movement, don't look for nice approval. I mean, it's nice to have that. I'm not saying, you know. And at the same time, please don't act strange to get this approval. <laughs> don't start wearing a big hat and the coat that is dragging on the ground. Okay? Don't, don't become looking so weird and strange. Oh, no, don't do that. Just look beautiful, loving, Simple, bright, cheerful, righteous, holy, faithful, pleasant Christian. What do you say? That when people see you, they can see that you're different. You see my friends. But they were young people, disappointed, but then they they held on. And the Bible says, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of year. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. What knowledge? Knowledge of the Bible prophecy. Run to and fro, run to and fro to seek the word of God. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the what? Time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand but the what? Why shall understand? So, so the angel, the Bible says, only who shall understand? Only wise people shall understand. Why wise people? Why God's people are this 
described as wise people. Because, listen, according to the Bible, and they that be what? Wise shall shine. Again, in Daniel chapter 12, it says, God's people, who are they? They're described as wise people. Again and again. Why? Because in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, Daniel is known for his wisdom. See? Wisdom. Chapter 2, wisdom. Chapter 5, wisdom. You see? So in the book of Daniel, Daniel is known. Daniel, God's people, is known as wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Therefore, at the end of the book of Daniel, God's people are described as wise people. So who shall understand 2008? Wise people. So you got to be a wise person. What do you say? Amen. Amen? So then, how to be a wise person? Job 28, 28, Bob says, And unto man, he said, Behold, the what? Fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and far from evil is understanding. So, in order to have wisdom, you have to have what? Fear, fear of the Lord. Okay? So that's the law. You have to have fear of the Lord. Number two. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man, what? <laughs> glory in his wisdom. So, if you want to be a wise man, don't glory in your wisdom. That's very interesting. How do, you, how do you get your wisdom? Fear of the Lord. But when you get it, what? Don't glory in your wisdom. Right? Yeah? You got to give your glory to who? You don't let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. So basically, if you're a wise man, you don't glory in your wisdom, but you give glory to what? To who? You, you give glory to God. So who are the wise people? They fear God and they give glory to God. And then Jeremiah 9.24, it says, But let him that glorious glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. So basically the Bible is saying, wise people, they fear God and give God glory. And then Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 5, the Bible says, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall fear no evil thing. And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. So who are the wise men? They fear God. Who are the wise men? They give glory to God. Who are the wise men? They understand time and judgment. Daniel 6, 26, the Bible says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. So according to the book of Daniel, when you fear God, you should fear what kind of God? Living God. And the Bible says, Psalms 96, verse 9, Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness and fear before Him. So when the Bible says fear, it also means worship. So what kind of God we should worship? Living God. So what kind of God we should worship? Living God. What kind of God is the living God? The living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in. So therefore, when you, when you fear the living God, you are worshiping the living God, meaning you're worshiping the Creator. So put it all together, ladies and gentlemen. You want to you be a wise man? Who are the wise men? Number one, you fear God. Number two, you give God the glory. Number three, you understand time and judgment. Number four, you worship the Creator. Ladies and gentlemen, behold. In the, in the, uh, in the three angels' message, the first angel's message, the Bible says, Revelation 14, verse 6, And I saw their angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them and dwell on the earth. To every nation, kingdom, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and what? Give glory to Him for the time of the judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and seas and fountains and water. Why do you think the first angel's message is like this? Who are the people who are giving this message? The wise. And they're giving this message because they understand something. What do they understand? 2,000 days, exactly. So those who understand 2,000 days, they will give properly the tremendous message. That's how it works. That's how it works. Ladies and gentlemen, who was really ready for the first coming of Jesus? Who was really ready for the first coming of Jesus? <laughs> now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came what? Wise men from the east. So who's going to be really ready for the second coming of Jesus? The wise man. That's right. So it works like this. Listen. So God sealed his message 2,000 days 
until the time of the end. But at the time of the end, the message is open. So during this time, how many years is that? During 46 years, God will raise up His people. How? Whoever can understand this part of this time prophecy, they're considered wise people. And they are God's people in the last day that will proclaim the three angels' message. Does this make you want to really understand 2,000 days more? Heavenly Sanctuary message? The Day of Atonement? The Investment Judgment? Yes! These are the present truth that we should understand today. So that, you see, until 798, sanctuary message has been <clears throat> trodden underfoot. People did not understand. They did not know about heavenly sanctuary message. They did not understand about sanctuary message, heavenly sanctuary message, for a long time. So during the Dark Age, they didn't understand. It was because of the persecution and the lack of the light and, and lack of Bible understanding. People didn't understand sanctuary message. So really, it was being trodden underfoot, so to speak, for a long time. But then, in 1798, sanctuary message was open, and then it was began to what? Restore. And how long did it take to restore the sanctuary message? 46 years, exactly. Do you know how long it, take, how long it took for the Israelites to rebuild the temple after they came out of Babylon in captivity? Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and will now put it up in 3 days. So Israelites, for them to build their temple, it took them 46 years. But right here, it took us 46 years to bring back the sanctuary message. Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly God's movement. And my question is, where are the true, real Seventh Adventists? Now, I'm not saying walking around, yeah, I'm the real one, I'm the genuine one. No, no, we don't need to do that. It's a challenge, amen? It's not a bragging point. It's not about show off. It's not to compare ourselves to other people. No, it's about do you really understand the message? Do you understand Jesus in the message? Do you have the experience? That's a challenge. Because the Bible says, whosoever understands this, they are God's people. And those young people, the pioneers, whether they're young, in order for them to understand the truth, they sweat, literally they sweat tears. And this reminds me of a story. When I was in China, one time I was in this place having a secret meeting. We had 30 church leaders. Most of them were young people. 15 to 20 young people. And we had a meeting there for seven days. Eating only two meals a day because they want to have more meetings. How many meetings? Nine to ten meetings a day. We had a meeting in chicken coops, chicken house. Because there was no electricity, we had a meeting as soon as sun went up, and we finished it just before sun went down. And one time we had electricity coming up at night, so we had more meetings. For seven days. My translator, our translator, was so tired, she was the only one that fell asleep. <laughs> she fell asleep during the break for five minutes. And I'm like, get up now, I have to teach again. And when we sing, we sing with whisper. When somebody knocks on the gate, we all hide like roaches hiding in the building. Because it was all secret, it's illegal. When we go out, we go out at night. That's how we get our fresh air. Seven days like that. At the end, those young people, 
like three or four of them came to me and they were in tears and I said, why are they crying? I asked my translator so my translator asked them, why are you guys crying? they cried because they know that our Bible study is about to come down and there is no more Bible study after that they cried because there is not, there's not any more Bible studies can you imagine? And then the, the guy that who allows us to have a meeting, he was persecuted, he was held by, uh, they, they held him, just tied his two thumbs on the ceiling, and they beat his back, put him upside down, put hot peppers in his nose. Same guy, again doing illegal religious activity. And when we say goodbye to them, they all cry. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, we lack of this kind of fire among young people today. There's something wrong in the homes. Something wrong in the education. Something we're not doing as a church. It's time for us to really look into the blueprint of the Bible and the Spirit. Our young people are more excited about American idols or pop stars, pop stars, that. Our young people, our family, our church, our leaders, all of us, we need to be rekindled with the spirit of true Adventism once again. Because Jesus is coming back. Do you want that? Can you see what's going on? Can you see from the, the prophecy? Now I understand the little book open. He's saying, basically, let me conclude with this stuff. Do you dare? It's not, can you understand it? No. Do you dare to understand this? Because it will require a great dedication. If you'd like to give that dedication to God, please. Just raise your hand humbly. Says, Lord, I want to experience this. I want to experience this in my life. Praise God. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for having us to understand the Bible and letting us know that it is important. It is a part of movement. It is a part of experience. As you allow your people to go through sweet and bitter experience, we will also go through similar things in the last days. We will be ridiculed. We will be challenged. People will not understand us. They will laugh at, uh, laugh at us. However, O Lord, continue to put that fervent desire and faith in us that no one on earth will stop us because we're standing upon the Word of God. At the same time, teach us to be not violent, not combative. At the same time, fervent and courageous in a very loving, kind, and meek, and cheerful, pleasant way, that we can be strong as a rock. So teach us to become like you, just, just like the way you were able to stand through all the rejections and all the trials. So now you're challenging us today. You're daring us to really, in this sense, to understand this, because in order for us to understand this, you're asking us, to really give all our hearts and mind. So today we want to do that and to turn our hearts to you. And Lord, please use us and finish your work through us. Thank you so much. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.